The White Witch Podcast with me, Carly. Hope you are all well, witches. On today's episode, we are talking all about fairy witchcraft. But to kick things off, we have our book review. And today's book is The Modern Witchcraft Book of Tarot, your complete guide to understanding the tarot, written by Sky Alexander. So one of my areas of focus for autumn and winter on my holy days as per the Danielle Dolsky book, The Holy World, that we reviewed and that will be covered in the Patreon, is getting to better grips with the tarot. I wanted a book to learn more about the history, different spreads, but also a book I could work with instead of just using good old biddy tarot that's fairly representative of the little book you get with the Rider weight deck that I had, which I lost a million years ago, I think my deck came with the little book. It's been close to 20 years since I was gifted my first tarot deck that I use regularly. So I bought this book last summer. Such as my aversion to working on my tarot practice, I've only just started reading it now and I love it. I like that it's aimed at witches as, of course, Sky Alexander has also written other witchcraft books such as The Modern Guide to Witchcraft, which we reviewed on one of the early podcast episodes. She also wrote Witchcraft, The Modern Witchcraft Spellbook and The Modern Witchcraft Grimoire. I believe she's written one about fairies too. I haven't read any of those. So keen to know if they're worth a read, especially the Grimoire one. So if you have read any of those, please do drop me a message or comment on any of my socials and let me know what you think. Firstly, aesthetically, I love this book. It's hardback, it has some wonderfully rustic, jagged edged pages, which feel like sort of parchment paper. The book's design is gorgeous. I'm all for books that look very old and vintage. So I adored the history of the tarot within this book, but also the outline on divination as a whole, not just tarot. I discovered some really interesting facts. For example, this one all about Frithias that I'm gonna read out to you. Oh, no, I've lost my page now. Bear with, bear with, bear with. <laughs> oh, Frivias, Celtic oracles known as Frivias, served as prognosticators for the Scots. Four times a year on the first Monday of each quarter, the Frivia would fast, then step outside blindfolded just before sunrise. Upon removing her blindfold, she opened her eyes and interpreted the meaning of the first thing she saw. So in regards to the history of tarot, we touched a little on that on the episode that my brother was on. This book definitely went into some more detail for me to get a general grasp on it. Nothing too deep, but it went into how it began as a renaissance card game for the rich and famous. Talked all about Italy's Tarocci, Also, how they were used as Islamic card games in the 14th and 15th century with the Mamluk pack that had an important influence on the tarot as we know it. Also, the Spanish card game of love, which was played by Spanish nobility in the 15th century, and it was called Juego de Napes. The cards were used to tell fortunes and reveal secrets in matters of love. I also found out more about Eliphas Levi, who of course we discussed in the Witch's Pyramid episode. So I'm gonna read you this little section of the book. In the 19th century, a French occultist who called himself Eliphas Levi linked the cards to the large and complex body of Jewish mysticism and theosophy known as Kabbalah. The historic basis for such a connection is questionable. The thousands of pages of Kabbalistic texts make no mention of cards or paintings, and yet the idea remains compelling. The Kabbalah structures itself around the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The major arcana consists of 22 trumps. 
The Kabbalah speaks of four worlds of existence and 10 stations on the tree of life. The tarot contains four suits, each with 10 numbered cards and four court cards. This book talks about the language of symbols that are of course used within tarot decks, color symbolism, numerology in the tarot, and of course each individual card and how to use them. There are multiple creative ideas that she poses. It definitely gave me a lot of inspiration. I think one of the key takeaways I took from this book was writing out my question I want to ask the tarot because I find before I'm about to do a spread, I find my question in my head gets a little bit wishy-washy before I start. So I've taken to writing out the question I want to ask before I start in the back of my book of shadows. And then also writing out what cards I get and my interpretation. I also like the concept she gave about how far forward she believed one could give a tarot reading for. So in essence, the tarot readings shelf life. And she said three months. So I am working with that in mind. I appreciate not everyone will agree with that, but I liked that clarity. For me, it sat well with me to work to three months looking ahead when I'm doing, you know, sort of future tarot spreads. The outline for the cards are probably what you would come to expect from perhaps the book that comes with the Rider Weight deck. Don't get me wrong, if Biddy Tarot could just bring out a book with all the tarot card descriptions they post, that would be great because to me that site is the best way I can get to grips with my cards. I have to say there are two things in the craft that I've never been very good at with despite years of being around them and they are tarot cards and crystals. I will forever be basic on these two, it seems, no matter how much I focus, it's never really been something that... I've been, you know, really aligned with. The back section of the tarot book is great. There are 12 different tarot sp spreads that she provides and a ton of spells that she has included in the book that all utilize tarot cards. And I really liked this. So there were love spells, prosperity, abundance spells, success spells, and miscellaneous spells. And they were all quite nice spells. They didn't expect ridiculous components. I quite liked that section too. Really like this book as a great way to learn the tarot and in, like integrate it into your craft. It's one I am now using regularly as I do my daily tarot spreads. I love using Biddy Tarot, but sometimes I feel it ruins my daily practice by whipping out my phone to Google. So I do like the concept of working with this book alone. Join me after the break when we talk all about fairy witchcraft. Welcome back. So let's talk all about fairy witchcraft. It's been a while since we talked about the Fae overall. Of course, we have the individual Fae episodes on our secondary podcast. We just had the Selkie and the Witch episode the other day. I think what struck me the most in relation to how much the fate and witches are linked is the quote I mentioned on the Selkie and the Witch episode, where an ex more cunning man stated that witches are fairies half born in human form. And that has stuck with me. And I like that fault. I've also heard it said that the fae are the witches best friends. So fairy witchcraft includes incorporating the fae into your magic, so working with them for help or guidance. Some witches will make promises or deals with a fae, and it's said that these must be spelled out specifically as fairies are notorious for keeping their word, but will sometimes keep it in a way you do not expect. Talking about spelling it out, you will see for this podcast episode, I have spelled fairy as F-A-E-R-Y instead of the Disney-centric version that has been romanticized for small pixie-like creatures. During the Victorian era, the fairy image became the one we are familiar with today, small-winged angelic beings. However, fairies are said to possess magic and powers like that of deities 
and they were often described as being human size in ancient Celtic societies. There are even a number of stories of fairies marrying and mating with humans, which of course couldn't have been the case if they were smaller than tiny hummingbirds. Fairies are known to be shapeshifters. They can appear as an animal, often as a result of their curiosity of humans. So they have been known to change into deers, badgers, butterflies, birds, to get a look at us without freaking us out. One of their many talents are glamours. So their ability to get humans to see what they want us to see. This can also be so we can't see them at all, or even they might wish to give us perhaps some stones, but using a glamour, make this appear to us as though they've given us gold. It's said that if you build a better trust and relationship with them, they are less likely to rely on glamours in a way that could be harmful. So fey magic is a form of wild magic. It's an incredibly nature-based practice it can be incorporated with Wicca and other witchy pagan practices. Fairy Wicca is said to consist of all the Wiccan traditions that stress real importance on the Fae and the natural world. It's said that just because we may not be able to see them, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't believe. And a fairy witch is said to be one who has a special affinity to the fairies their talent comes from deep communication with nature and animals are often very trusting of fairy witches. Not all fairies are the same. Generally speaking, fae spirits, they're either considered as spirits of nature who have control over the elements, which one depends on their heritage. They possess powerful healing, beauty and love magic. Their strong relationship with nature attaches them to the area that they dwell within. If you're kind with nature, they may have already noticed that and occasionally help you. However, other accounts of the Fae I've found believe that nature spirits and fairies are dissimilar and that fairies overall can work with any element and like humans have unique customs, social laws, personalities and taboos. The jury is out, so you might wish to consider what you believe. The word fairy or the fae has become a blanket term for a lot of beings, energies and phenomena. Fairies are said to be spirits that inhabit a place, live in the nature surrounding it, live in this world and their own realm. They can be unseen, they can be minuscule or unfathomably large and take on characteristics linked to the environment that they live in. Fairies are said to be the intellect behind the living things in nature. Everything, of course, is energy and it's believed that the energy surrounding and living in nature is fairies. So one thing I believe or think is working with the fae is brilliant if you need to tap into perhaps inner child work and adopt a more light-hearted childlike view of the world so perhaps visualizing working alongside the spirits of the natural world one of the reasons I am so keen on the fae are all the different types that there are but also the close Celtic links that they have for example, we've talked about, you know, the English, Scottish, Welsh, Irish medicine women we looked at who have worked with the Fae for help within their healing work. They had, you know, Fae who told them which herbs to use in their healing practices. Many witches have a different take on working with the Fae. I personally straddle the two. It is a very new area for me. I must admit to perhaps not paying it much attention in my practice up till now. It's a mixture of fear and fascination. I'm not sure that I'm brave enough to work with them yet, but that's my personal feelings right now. And to be honest, I have enough going on in my practice to have not got to that stage as yet. I'm not saying I never would, but I definitely believe in them. I have had some weird things happen to me in my house and garden that me and my daughter have always put down to the fae. 
we believe the Fae have pinched things and we've asked them kindly to return them to us. And it's been a bit of a running tradition for a little while now. I know my daughter definitely believes. As with any kind of magic, the types of energy and spirits you are inviting in need to be accounted for. Just like in nature, there is, of course, light and dark. They are an extension of the earth, pulsing with ancient power that's very hard to describe. So I read an amazing article on a website called solstice-sisters.co.uk, where a very experienced fey witch advised that she had manifested more than she could ever have imagined due to blessings from the fey folk. She also advised that they had helped her with working with her shadow self in ways she didn't think possible and this she did alongside working with her deities. So the fairy folk are also known as the good folk. They are ancient beings that are said to have inhabited our lands long before the Celts. Fairies are said to have descended from the Tuahu de Danan, the magical race of gods and goddesses we have referenced on many episodes that resided in Ireland after descending from the sky at Beltane. Due to the fairies' connection with the Tuahu de Danan, many witches who practice fairy magic will often work with the Celtic pantheon. The fae are said to be mysterious, unseen, constantly working their magic to shape the world around us, living in trees, rocks, on the breeze, the grass, and every living part of the earth. They can sharp as wisps of light or stay invisible, only known by the things they move around and leave behind. The Fae incorporates beings such as selkies, mermaids, trolls, elves, gnomes, dragons, a cluster of mythological creatures that can cross the veil into our realm. Some believe the Fae ruled our lands, but once man started to destroy their natural habitat, they crossed the veil into another realm. Like humans, some of the Fae are good and some are said to be bad. There's a lot of grey when it comes to the Fae. It's said that should you meet a fairy that's not so nice, you should assert your boundaries and tell them no. Working with any spirit, you need to clearly lay out your personal boundaries beforehand and have thoroughly researched them before inviting them into your space. Don't let anyone fearmonger you into thinking that they are all evil. On the particular article I read, it states that from experience, this fairy witch finds that they mostly just want snacks and good hiding spots and not to kidnap you into the fairy realm. Don't we all just want snacks? We aren't so dissimilar after all. <laughs> so each type of the Fae has its own type of magic and limitations, it is said, which is usually tied to an element of nature. So it's said that if you wanted to do a spell or work on grounding, call on the gnomes. For communication, reach out to the sylphs. Selkies can be called upon for water magic. It's key to look into each form of the Fae and what sort of magic and intentions they might be able to help you with. If you are experiencing signs of the Fae visiting you, you might want to do some digging and try and figure out which type is trying to get your attention. Identifying which form of the Fae is an important part of Fae magic. Not all forms of the Fae will be helpful to you for your intentions. Fairy magic relies a lot on listening to the messages of the fairy folk. So listening to your intuition and doing what makes your spirit feel good. It's embracing the chaos and the unknown. These beings can help us connect to the earth's frequency and nature. And there is no real rhyme or reason when it comes to the fae. That makes me think of the you fairy we talked about on the Bewitching Poisonous Plants episode. She was so ancient, or she is so ancient, it makes no sense trying to understand how she works or communicates because they don't communicate on the same wavelengths as us. In fact, the vibration in the fairy realm, a part of the other world, exists on a parallel to ours. It's so different, but it allows the other world to exist simultaneously to Earth. 
From time to time, these vibrations might change, allowing entrances through which people have stumbled through occasionally. The Fae teach us to live in the moment and I guess have faith that they exist and they teach us to love life as it shows up. Overall, fairy magic is asking them to assist you in your spells and rituals, but also opening yourself up to the lessons that they have to teach. It's confidence in their abilities and existence and your own power as a witch who can manifest anything that they want. Sadly, it's said that the Fae always feel estranged from humans, but it is said that if you so choose, you can build a relationship built on faith and hope for the future with the Fae. It is said that if you opt to do this, you must ensure you are aware you are inviting the fairies in as they are a powerful force of nature and be honest, respectful and kind with them as well as you would be nature too. So one of the best forms of fairy magic can be flower magic and it doesn't have to be gardening either. Fairies love flowers and they have a habit of dwelling by them. So these are some good flowers to have or bring into your home. Firstly, we have lavender. So this herb has been used since antiquity to help you establish connection with the fairy realm. Planting it in your garden will encourage them too. Marigold. So jam made from marigolds is said to help you see fairies and planting it overall will help attract them. Thyme. So we talked a little bit about this on the herbs episode. I wrote about this in my book, The Herb of Courage that was mentioned in Shakespeare's play A Midsummer's Night Dream. So Oberon, king of the fairies, states that I know a bank where the wild thyme blows potentially referring to the bed of Titania, queen of fairies. Thyme is a popular herb of the fae and it is said that they love to dance around thyme in the garden. A pagan belief was that if the fae had any part in any of your objects going missing, you could, on the night of a full moon, leave them an offering of thyme along with something sweet to eat and a kindly, polite request for them to help you find said lost item. If you are lucky, they may be happy to help you with the search or return of the item as a result. Rosemary is usually planted in gardens to invite kind-hearted and wise fairies and elven spirits. The pansy. So if love is what you are looking for, then plant pansies and ask the fae to bring you that's what you are looking for. Foxglove. Legend has it that fairies like to hide in foxglove. If foxglove is growing in your garden, it will attract fairies and other nature spirits to guard the garden and the household that takes care of the plant. Mimosa, the enchanting smell of this wonderful plant is said to attract fairies like a magnet. The sweet nectar of honeysuckle is said to help the fairies notice you. Snapdragons, where these are planted, will increase fairy activity and they are said to bless you with enchanting beauty. Violet, so all violets are said to be sacred to fairies and planting violet is said to be a shortcut to the fairy realm. Primrose, this magical plant invites in the fae but is said to actually help you to see them and interact with them. Bluebells. Fairies apparently like to come and dance in places where bluebells are planted. So I appreciate in the Northern Hemisphere, it is not the time to be planting things, but for our witches in the Southern Hemisphere, this is your time. You might wish to decorate your altar with pictures or statues of the Fae. Bring a bowl of water and enchant it with some sweet words for the fairies and leave it upon your altar. Fairies love to dwell where water is near, so by the sea, lakes, rivers and magical bowls of water on your altar. You might wish to refresh the water daily and gift the old water to perhaps your plants or nearby trees. You might want to add little wind chimes or bells to your altar area as apparently they love the sounds of these. They love tiny cakes, jasmine, crystals, plants, don't we all? 
You might find random things that you think that they will like that just within your intuition comes up that you feel you need to leave, like maybe a stick or a rock that you found on a walk in nature or some tiny berries, just anything that comes up perhaps signifies the fae are knocking on your subconscious. So I have a fairy altar blessing here that you might wish to try. It has a little bit of a ritual involved with it too for your new fae orientated altar. This is the fairy altar blessing. So you will need incense, a candle, a bowl of water, a bowl of salt, fairy dust. Now, you can buy this, but personally, and I have also seen it written, that you can make your own. And I would do this using the flowers, dried flowers or herbs or mix the two together that you know that they love or resound with them. But perhaps you might want to tie it in with any magical correspondences for work that you want to do with them. Also, you'll need a small bowl of wine, some tiny candies, so sweets, and a moonstone. Here is the blessing that you might wish to say to them. Fairies, on this night, I bring you gifts of pure delight. This altar I dedicate unto you, my faith I pledge, fair and true. I ask you now to come and stay, and through the summer we shall play. On Sabbaths and on Esbets too, your offerings I will renew. Come dance and sing and play with me, your trust I'll earn, so mote it be. Light your incense, place it on your altar, and you can say, This fairy altar I bless with air, Incense with the Fae I share. Light the candle, place it on your altar and say, I bless this altar by warmth of fire. To please the Fae is my desire. Sprinkle your altar with water and say, A gift of water now I give to the Fae where they shall live. Sprinkle salt in a circle around the altar and say, I give you now the gift of earth, the grounding force of love and mirth. Sprinkle your fairy dust on your altar and say, fairy dust I give to you to show you friendship that is true. Place a small bowl of wine on your altar and say, to you I offer lovely wine, a taste your love, it's simply divine. Sprinkle your sweets on your altar and say, please accept these sweets, I hope you like these little treats. Place your moonstone on your altar and say, Moonstone protects and opens the door which divides our worlds, friends evermore. I hope you like that and I'll link that in the show notes. So once you have your space for the face set up and you've welcomed them in, you might want to work on meditating in your sacred space, dedicated to the fae, visualizing the fairies and the fairy realm. This will also get the Fae used to your energy as they are just as curious about us as we are of them, even more so apparently. They have a tendency to be suspicious of humans who want to work with them as they are used to humankind pushing them underground and making them small. They will apparently visit when they are comfortable with your energy and intentions. So meditation is said to be a great starting point. A lot of the relationship between us and them is based on trust. They don't trust humans easily and the same as we've been convinced that they are tricksters out to get us. All they are aware of is the harm we have caused them and their home, so how we have affected nature. Most of the Fae will apparently happily share their knowledge and work with you, but providing you show respect for them and their ways. It is said that if you approach them with dishonest intentions or disrespect, they will bring it back on you out of self-preservation, not to be malicious. It takes time and a lot of patience to build relationships with the Fae, but it's said to be worth it in that they are said to be able to help you with your magic as long as you don't take their help for granted. So remembering to be grateful for their gifts or blessings and leaving them out offerings in return. So I thought I would delve into some other beliefs or sort of folklore in relation to the Fae. And some of this goes against some of what we discussed from the Fae Witch. So firstly, I have five rules I came across to interacting with the fairies that I came across. I'm not saying I believe all of this. 
I am kind of inclined to go with they are not trying to lure us and trap us into the fairy realm belief. But here are some common rules and beliefs by some other witches. The first is to be aware that names have power. Give yourself a nickname or give them no name at all. The second rule, do not accept anything edible from a fairy as it is said to eat from the lands of the fae is to lock yourself out from the land of mortals. The third is regarding information. So it is said that if a fairy gives you information, do not thank them. You can say you appreciate their assistance, but thanking them is tantamount to admitting a debt being owed. I do kind of believe in this one. The fourth rule is about accepting gifts. Be very cautious when doing so, as many gifts are said to have unforeseen side effects. If a gift is offered to you, it is said you should accept it. If you do not trust the fairy that offered it to you, though, don't hesitate to destroy it. And salt water is always a good cleanser for this. The fifth rule that I came across is to speak to them without offence, which I think you should do for anybody and everybody anyway. But most fae are said to be very old, and this means propriety is very important. Grudges can be held for centuries, and it is said that if you do not wish to do something, the way you refuse the fae is critical, so be polite. Anything less than may land you in hot water. So this came from a page on Pinterest and <laughs> someone put in the comments after this list, which made me crack up. So this is the comments. So what you're saying is fairies are basically the magical mafia. Do not F with the magical mafia. What if all mafia in the world was actually orchestrated by the fae or mafias are our subconscious attempt to emulate them? This cracked me up, but lots of witches in the comments agreed these are pretty good rules to live by. I wonder what you think. So I also saw law that said you should be careful what you agree to as they will remember. So I might have covered some of these on our earlier fate episode, but this is a good refresher and there are definitely some new ones that I have found and thrown in too. So these are ways to tell if a fairy is nearby feeling warm tingles upon your skin. Things go missing and then reappear somewhere else in your home. They will take things because they like them or to get your attention. You see things out the corner of your eye, usually a flash of light or movement. Elf locks. This can be where you have random knots sharp in your hair that have clearly been tied. Finding yourself participating in childlike activities like skipping or swinging on the swing or something like that. You come across random floral scented breezes. You make a habit of starting to bring nature inside. You find yourself admiring insects. And when you find one in your home, you set it free instead of squishing it. Don't ever do that. <laughs> you find yourself stumbling over fairy circles. You are followed by a crow or raven. You hear mysterious giggling, voices or music unlike anything you have ever heard on earth. Talking could be ghosts, but with ghosts it is said that you can normally understand the conversation and they can only muster up the energy to say a few words. The Fae will hold conversations in a language you have never heard before. If you find large patches of clover, especially four-leaf clovers, a strong scent of apples, grass or wild violet, you hear soft chiming bells, you see mushroom circles or you hear strange haunting or jovial music. You might want to look into local folklore which provides insight into the land where you live Folklore often originates from a time period that predates the disenchantment of the world that came with the emergence of science as we know it today. Perhaps talk to the elderly about stories they might know where you live. Seek out old and ancient books. Search through the internet and databases at your local library relating to myth and folklore for where you live. So, you might want to begin by starting to work with a house fairy. 
Starting small allows you to learn about working with the Fae because it's not the same as working with deities and human spirits. This will give you experience and wisdom and an ally. And you can gradually expand your network of fairy allies as you build your practice. How spirits have been with the land long before your home was built. Ancient writing and law all concur that house spirits tend to dwell in or around mainly the kitchen of your home. So you might wish to dedicate a small space for the house spirit in your kitchen where you leave offerings, perhaps like a bowl of milk or cream that is quite a popular offering for them that you can't really go wrong with. In Morgan Daimler's book, she says that the fair folk are very much tit for tat, as in you must be prepared to pay them for blessings that they provide and know that unless you specify what you will give them in return, they will set the price. And of course, you don't want them to do this because you could incur their wrath if you cannot pay them their demanded price. So just like working with deities, it is said that negotiation is perfectly acceptable and also advisable. So if you have a notion or receive omens that they want you to give them your wedding ring, let's say, in exchange for something or something of high value to you that you don't want to let go of, then you can kind of speak to them and say, I appreciate your willingness for helping me with my problem. I am willing to offer you and then make some kind of counter offer of what you'll give them instead. So it's said that you should trust your instinct on this. If you get a good feeling, then most likely this is them accepting your offer. But if you feel uneasy, still make other suggestions. So it said that you should also, as I said earlier, use your best manners, use words like, you know, please, may I, but the only thing you apparently shouldn't ever say is thank you or thanks. The theory with this is that thank you is equivalent to I owe you. Even if you have agreed upon and paid your due for whatever you have asked for, the thank you will give them the notion that you are in their debt. So it is said that you should use instead like I appreciate this or this is exactly what I needed. Fairies apparently hate filth. So if you want to start working with them, it is said that you should clean up your home, attend to the little details such as taking out the rubbish, clean up the dishes, pick up after yourself. And it is offensive to invite in a house spirit to an altar in your kitchen if it is a disgusting space. So I won't be inviting in any anytime soon. I need to get on that. <laughs> Another point I came across was to never overestimate yourself and that it doesn't matter if you've been a witch for 50 years and that you come from a long line of witches, you'll never be more powerful than a fairy. So basically said like, don't get cocky. And it is also advised that the fair folk that befriend you would have no hesitation in literally driving you insane and find it hilarious whilst you are like crying and pulling your hair out if they feel that perhaps you've like underestimated them or overestimated yourself. The Fae apparently can bless your life, but they can be mean if offended. So oh, I really like to stick to the other Fae witches points about them only being mean if it's for self-preservation. I'm conflicted and I just want to say I'm just giving you this information because it is what I've researched. Like I am by no means a fey witch. I have a huge interest in it. This episode is made up of like a ton of research from loads of different resources that I've gone through to kind of find the points that most stick and are most consistent. So please like do with it what you will. I'm not trying to tell you what to do in your practice at all as ever. I'm just giving you like examples of the same information that I see that seems consistent. Okay, so also you should learn how to protect yourself as what can work against one fairy may attract another. So by starting small and, you know, working with like a house fairy and then building up gradually, you can build your network of fairy allies. 
And very importantly, apparently you shouldn't use the word fairy when you are speaking to them as the F word is one that angers them, same as it angers my mum when I use it. So instead you should use terms with them such as, and these are words and names that they have been given and the, they apparently like. So you've got the good neighbours, good people, people of peace, fair family, fair folk, mother's blessings, gentry and the noble people. So I've got some offerings for the Fae and this is a bit of an increased list from the one that I gave you on the original Fae episode. So you might wish to leave these at magical places around you such as by mushroom rings, tree hollows and streams. And of course, if you're starting out, you want to try and work with like a house spirit, house fairy, of course, somewhere allocated in your kitchen. So we have milk. Milk and cream is like scent said to be the one that you can't go wrong with. You've also got honey and honey acts like a magnet. They are said to love it and they use it in several recipes and magic potions Fairy magic has several spells where honey is required. Offer a small bowl of honey to them and you can ask them if they will come and just say words that come to your heart. You might wish to ask for friendship, love, faith, magic, hope and healing. When it comes to any spell work that you do with them, that involves honey. They love sugar cubes, they love shiny things, they love berries, dried flowers, rings, beads, rocks, crystals, cream, sweets, cakes, cookies, clean water, tea and little trinkets. But again, if ever you are unsure, I've heard that anything with milk or cream is a firm favourite of theirs. So pay attention to your instincts. If something tells you you are not welcome when it comes to the Fae, whether it be just a change in wind direction, sudden darkness or animals nearby being hostile, it is said that you should leave and, you know, try and stop your magical workings, what you're doing, like don't push it. So I thought we should also talk about the fairy star, also known as the septogram or elven star. And I'll put a picture of this in the show notes too. So this is used instead of or with the pentagram by many fairy and Celtic based traditions. The seven points represent the sun, the forest or wood, the sea, magic, the moon, the wind and connection or spirit. The fairy star is said to be a gift from the Fae to help us understand and communicate with them. So you might wish to make one and put it on your altar to signify that you are open to communication with them. So an alternative set of definitions rests upon use of the fairy or elven star as a gateway to the other world. Each point of the star is one of the entrances to the fairy realm a pathway or the seven rays of manifestation of the higher self as follows. So the first point of the star is said to stand for power, personal will and determination. Second point of the star, unconditional love, wisdom and growth. The third point relates to knowledge and intelligence. The fourth point of the star relates to harmony and tranquility the fifth point relates to powers of mind and science. The sixth point relates to devotion and honesty. The seventh, seventh point, magic. The points blend with each other, nurturing and joining us as one with the universe, bestowing personal and spiritual transformation. And that came from Fairy Cat on WordPress. I have seen other septograms or fairy stars and they have on like, different planetary links there are quite a few examples but yeah I really do like the fairy star it's definitely something that I'd like to incorporate into my altar it's said that you should look for fairies at Litha and Beltane and the best time to sight the fae is on liminal times of the day such as at dawn noon twilight and midnight in order to catch a glimpse of the Fae, look through a stone that has a natural hole in it or through a loop made with a rowan twig. If you should spot the Fae, make sure you look at them steadily as they will disappear when you blink or look aside. 
I read that they use glamours to enable humans to see them and that only animals will ever see the fae clearly. Butterflies may also be fairies in disguise, so you may want to encourage them to visit your garden. So perhaps you have your fairy altar, your kitchen space to place your cream or milk. Your house is nice and tidy and maybe you've made your fairy star. The fae are said to be very particular and like humans have their own personality and customs. According to Morgan Daimler, the fae have seven virtues that they look for in a friend. And these are number one, hospitality. When you start your relationship with your house spirit, make it clear that they are more than welcome in your home. After all, they likely have been there since before the building was built. Number two, generosity. Instead of throwing out your dinner leftovers, perhaps save a last few bites for the fae, a flat rock or tree stump makes a good place for outside offerings. Number three, kindness, use your manners. Number four, compassion. So pick up rubbish, feed birds, help wildlife when needed. All of these actions show you have compassion for nature and her creatures. Number five, courage. Courage to call upon fairies of goodwill shows courage. So a little fear is natural and to be expected if you opt to start working with the fae. Number six, politeness. As long as you don't say thank you. Number seven, adventuresomeness. The fae love a spontaneous adventure. So let your wild side be free and the fae might join you on your outdoor adventures. So I thought we could talk about fairy moons or she moons. These are the opposite of blue moons. And again, they occur every two and a half years. So a fairy moon is a second dark moon in a month, the point when there is no moon in the sky to our eyes. Obviously, there's always a moon in the sky. Some witches believe that you should not cast magic on new moons and that you should use that time to relax instead. It is even thought by some that magic cast on a new moon will turn sour. I am not that witch. I like to do a lot of work on a new moon. However, superstition is that it was worse to cast on a she moon, which is believed to be associated with death. However, as with all things, other will, others will argue that you can cast at any time and that the she moon, like the blue moon, will make the magic more powerful. And I am inclined to believe that. So I also have the fairy blue healing spell that you might wish to use. And again, I'll put this in the show notes. So on the night of the full moon, gather together an indigo candle, lavender essential oil and cowslip, nettle and or mint herbs. You will also need a picture of the person to be healed and a magic wand. Place a blue cloth upon your altar and decorate it with all things fairy. Be sure to wear something flowing and magical. Don't forget to include a gift for Fairy Blue. She will expect fair payment for her help. Carve the name and astrological symbols on the candle and anoint it with the lavender oil. Place it in the candle holder, then sprinkle the herbs in a circle around it. Light the candle and explain your needs to Fairy Blue. Pick up your magic wand and envision yourself surrounded by a circle of sparkling blue light. Allow the light to enter your body through the top of your head and travel down your body into your arms, into your hands, into the tips of your fingers and into your wand. See the wand fill with light, then see the light begin to flow from the tip of the wand. Point the wand towards the picture and visualize the picture completely surrounded by shimmering, healing, blue light. See the person in the picture completely healthy and free of all illness. Concentrate for a few moments, then wave your wand back and forth, visualizing the healing blue energy flowing out and up into the universe. Once all the energy has dissipated, place your wand on your altar. Present the offering to Fairy Blue while chanting this three times. Beautiful Fairy of Healing Blue, accept this gift I offer you. I thank you for your help tonight. You gave the gift of healing light. So I just want to credit some of the sites that I used for this research and they are Magical Recipes Online, 
solstice-sisters.co.uk, which had the best outline for working with the Fae, queenavabina.com, exemplar.com. That was a brilliant page for this topic. Woo, I think that's all I have in me for fairy witchcraft for today, witches. So aside from that, if you would like grimoire pages for all of this fairy information that we talked about today, come on over to Patreon, the White Witch Coven. There will be a link in the show notes. Six pounds a month, you get grimoire pages in a very dark, witchy academia style for all the topics that we cover in season two. There are also ones for season one that are gradually being uploaded onto there also. But there is a ton of extra witchy content. You also get an exclusive Patreon episode every month witchy chat in the witchy community that we have all of the witches are absolutely lovely there's some beautiful souls in there we are learning so much from one another it is only six pounds a month you can cancel at any point if you ever felt the need to you are not tied into it for life and yeah come on over you can ask lots of questions about your craft you will have people to connect with we are all in the same witchy boat If you feel the call to, I'd be ever so grateful if you could leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It means that other witches can find the show. You can find me on Instagram at The White Witch Company. I'm over on Facebook, The White Witch Company. And my email address is carly at thewhitewitchcompany.co.uk. I'm really excited because this week I had the final cover for my book, The White Witch's Book of Healing. I have been told that this should be out in October. So I'm going to be telling you a bit more about that shortly. I'm super excited. It is really emotional. I love the cover. I can't wait to show you all what's been going on in the, you know, behind the scenes. But aside from that, I will catch up with you all soon on our next episode. Lots and lots and lots of witchy love.